Well, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about MariaDB server 10.3. And um, I'm happy to talk to you also about other things like community developer relations and so forth. And uh, thank you, Oracle, for sponsoring this track because um, we've, we realized that well, MariaDB is also kind of important and there was absolutely no <laughs> talk about it. No one submitted. So, um, and, and Harish, who was one of the organizers of Boss Asia uh, a while ago, was asking, you know, would you go and use MariaDB or MySQL? And actually, the answer the answer is um, really depends on your use case, right? They they're now two fairly different databases. They're not the same anymore, uh, with the exception of maybe some very nice folks at say Alibaba, who actually run services on MySQL and then port things to uh, MariaDB so that it could go upstream. Uh, most people are just going to be like, hey, I'm going to hack on MySQL and make MySQL better. And that's what other people like, uh, for example, Facebook do when they migrate stuff, and uh, Arcona as well. So I think, um, yeah, things are changing. And Red Hat very famously in uh, Enterprise Linux 7 actually went to use um, MariaDB as a default. Uh, but that's pretty much when everything sort of started diverging around the 5.5 uh, times. And I, if you're sticking around this track, I think there are excellent talks on 8.0, so plenty of divergence. So MariaDB server, I actually took this um, straight out of the website today, MariaDB.org. It still claims to be an enhanced drop-in replacement for MySQL, and frankly, that is false. It is not an enhanced drop-in replacement for MySQL. It is a GPL fork of MySQL 5.5. It has some features that are different from MySQL, and MySQL has some features that are different from MariaDB. And some features may be the same, but most of them uh, are fairly different now. Uh, so it's not a, a full drop-in replacement. You can upgrade um, still from, say, MySQL 5.7 to MariaDB. But if you want to cross-grade, which is what the Debian people face a lot, because Debian actually went all, all in on MariaDB. And if you want to cross-grade between, say, MySQL and MariaDB, that's not, not going to work for you. If you want to replicate between each other, that's, that's also not going to work for you uh, because global transaction IDs have changed. MySQL has a different GTF global transaction ID format compared to MariaDB, but you can attach a MariaDB replica to a MySQL master, and the MariaDB will throw away the global transaction IDs that it gets from MySQL and generate its own. So you can migrate to MariaDB. It is much harder to migrate out and migrating out would probably require a dump and a restore. However, there are some cases where even a dump and restore will not work. Like if you use data types, like the decimal data type, MySQL decimal data type limits uh, 30. Is that still true with 8.0? Yes. MariaDB decided to extend it to 38 to make it more Oracle compatible. So if you decide to extend it yourself, and then dump, you are not going to be able to restore. That's not the only subtle change. There are many other subtle changes. Data types are just one of them. So this is a wonderful diagram of divergence. And you could generally say MySQL 5.5 spawned the Pagona Server 5.5 and MariaDB 5.5. MySQL 5.6 was kind of a bit of a rewrite compared to 5.5, and 5.7 and 8.0 are even further rewrites. The MariaDB stopped um, merging after 5.5. MariaDB started cherry picking patches after 5.5. So th this is why not all features are, are included. And I think that's, that means some very important milestones. For one, 5.5 brought this InnoDB scalability. Uh, lots of people love InnoDB and use InnoDB. Though yesterday even I had a, a I was on a phone call with a client, and they were like, oh yeah, we're using MySAM. I'm like, it's 2019, like, why? But so some people people still use MySAM, that's, uh, that's unfortunate. Uh, 5.6 also brought us uh, lots of optimized improvements in MySQL, but MariaDB went their own way in, from 5.3 onwards to have optimized improvements of their own. So the optimizer is, for all intents and purposes, not the same. And then, just to add some, some confusion, MariaDB, if you go to MariaDB.com where the documentation is, 
um, you'll find that there's this thing about, there's this thing called MariaDBTX, 3.0, like, I don't even know why this number exists, but TX, it turns out, is a combination of the open source MariaDB server, which you get from MariaDB.org, and it is uh, services, maybe not fully open source, from MariaDB.com. So you may be able to get things like connectors, which are LGPL. Lots of people love the LGPL connectors. So um, you know, uh, Amazon will encourage you to use it with Aurora, for example. But then you also get uh, access to things like MaxScale, which is a which is a proxy that is not open source license, right? It's business source license. And so you have alternative proxies that one could use, like Proxy SQL that works with both MySQL and MariaDB. There is another wonderful proxy called Router, which I think at least there will be one talk about here later when it comes to the UDP cluster stuff. That does not work with MariaDB. And of course, there's Maria Backup, which is a fork of Proton Extra Backup. That's open source. Uh, SQL Log and Monolog are, are not open source, but they are they used as well. And then uh, for added confusion, there's also something called TX Cluster, which includes support for Galera Cluster. Galera Cluster is is like is based on the same paper that Group Replication is based on, and uh, well, I guess it's been around for a lot longer than Group Replication has. It's been around maybe since 2008 ish. So probably has a lot more users than Group Replication in production, but uh, I suspect uh, Group Replication is also getting a lot of investment from uh, Oracle. So. You're going to start seeing, start, start seeing it be a uh, useful synchronous replication solution that people start adapting. And I don't know who will adopt it first, but uh, in a wide scale fashion, but I, accept, I expect that will happen. And then there's also this thing called AX or Column Store. Column Store is actually fully open source, but it's not integrated to the MariaDB server. Um, it is based uh, on InfiniDB, which surprisingly, Oracle owned the copyrights to when they picked it up at the bankruptcy court. So anyway, key points from MariaDB 10.3, uh, which was announced uh, last May, so 10.4 will come out this May. Uh, it has Oracle compatibility, or at least some semblance of Oracle compatibility. How many of you use the Oracle database? Show hands, like, anybody write PLSQL here? Okay, so if you if you fancy not paying Oracle <laughs> for your database use case, you may you may consider migrating for Oracle compatibility. And I think one of the biggest um, use cases that have been promoted by MariaDB Corporation for this is a Singaporean company. Actually, it, it's the it's a famous bank. Can anybody give me a guess as to which famous bank in Singapore has migrated to use Oracle compatibility for MariaDB? Yes. Hmm? DBS, yes. So they are, um, I guess, yeah, one of their, I think we migrated some 30 odd applications. I gotta be careful what I say because it's being recorded and I don't work at the corporation, but I also wanna make sure I don't say anything that's not public. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so Oracle compatibility, uh, lots of people seem to seem to like it. Now, is it is it uh, equivalent to what you get in Postgres? Uh, the answer is, is no. But is it maybe 80% of what you get? The answer is probably yes. And you, you, you'll probably be the 20% that get annoyed when something doesn't work. And then you know, you, because it's open source, you cannot contribute to make it better. Plenty more storage engines um, that people could use. So MySQL is, is all in on InnoDB. And uh, MySQL 8 comes with another storage engine, it's surprising that it's not InnoDB called TempTable. The TempTable storage engine, yes? So, um, and of course, it's got my eyes out still. But um, the, the reality is, MariaDB ships things like MyRox, Spider, and we have slides for that as well. Uh, temporal data, which is system version tables, this is, a, this is something new from the Oracle, from, from the SQL standard, not from Oracle, it's from SQL 2011. And uh, it it's, doesn't exist in uh, MySQL uh, yet, probably will eventually. And uh, of course, it's got some features from earlier versions of MariaDB that are most likely, that may not be in MySQL. And I'm going to highlight only those features because the reality is, um, you know, MariaDB may, may, may catch up, but MySQL eventually may, 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 may catch up, but, you know, as of 10.3, I'm going to just focus on what was not available. So, in terms of releases, MariaDB aims for release cadence now of once every year around the May timeframe. And the 10.4 is a release candidate already. 
From what I gather, Oracle's release um, cadence is around the 24 month plus mark to, because they only want to support two releases at any given time. And uh, this, it's, it's worth noting that, for example, 5.5 is end of life already. It was end of life like late last year. And um, this is going to be interesting from a you know, security reporting standpoint because you're going to start finding that there are going to be bugs that exist, say, in MySQL 8 that maybe don't exist in RayDB and MySQL. So MySQL and RayDB, of course, are very unique when it comes to storage, storage engines. Well, they were very unique. Uh, to be fair, MongoDB for now about three odd years have this, this capability of having multiple storage engines. But what MongoDB ended up doing is they basically said, look, we like this wire tiger storage engine, so they integrated it. And they've deprecated and disabled MMAP v1, which is the R version of my ISAM. So I think MongoDB is a little ahead of MySQL from a deprecation standpoint. Is that so that's, uh, but, uh, and it's also much easier to write a storage engine for MongoDB than it is for MySQL. MySQL, you have to you know, provide for the index types, uh, if it's got transactions or not, you've got to provide for you know, backup, a, a backup strategy, if it has foreign keys or not. JS functionality is not provided by the engine, it's provided by the, by the storage engine itself, full text search capabilities, and so forth. Lots of things make them different. And MariaDB, if you type show engines, is the smallest board of, of engines. It has so many storage engines that it looks really tiny on the slide deck. So uh, I have slides dedicated for, say, MyRaft and Spider. InnoDB is the default for read-write applications, as, as has been for a while. It used to be Percona HDB, but um, all the HDB features, according to MariaDB anyway, to be fair, have been migrated to, towards InnoDB upstream. That there's not much variance in HDB any longer. And uh, they also have a couple of InnoDB hackers working at um, MariaDB now. Column store is not included, as I mentioned earlier. OQ graph, uh, so what I don't have slides for, uh, right, as an example, is OQ graph. And it's, it's, it also actually still gets changes to it. It's got something called the leaves algorithm that actually returns all the reachable leaf nodes. So you can do uh, graph-based queries in a relational database. Now, if you ask why you should use OQ graph over Neo4j, my, my advice is use Neo4j. Like, OQ graph is uh, kind of like a, maybe a little toy, so to speak. It's a toy graph uh, engine. The partition engine, which is now uh, still part of, it's going to be, obviously, it's part of MariaDB, but it's not part of MySQL 8, because partitioning is now built inside of uh, the InnoDB engine. But partitioning is how Spider works, and uh, we'll have some slides in Spider as well. Uh, Cassandra is still around, so if you have a Cassandra engine pre Cassandra 1, uh, you can actually, via LibDrift, actually allow you to run SQL queries against the Cassandra backend. Should you use this today? My, my answer is also no, don't uh, connect. This is actually quite an interesting engine because it can uh, read, say, MongoDB, you can read uh, JSON, you can read uh, DB4. Anybody use DB4 before? Let's get DBase4, basically. If you still happen to have something that exists, uh, you know, files, you found a floppy disk from 20 years ago and you managed to find a reader, you can actually open up your, your DBase 4 files um, with Connect. It's still kind of good for ETL operations, like you make ODBC connections and so forth. There's also another engine called TalkUDB, which uh, is ba it's basically an engine focusing on good insert speeds and, uh, and compression. But I suspect that eventually uh, MyRox is what's going to take over that uh, use case. So I probably have to go much quicker now because I only have what, 10 minutes left. So MariaDB has a bunch of uh, aims around storage engines. Uh, it's, it wants to be a general purpose database uh, with many purpose built storage engines. So the MariaDB idea is you shouldn't be going out there and using like uh, a time series database or a graph database. You use MariaDB for everything. And um, you know that might have been true a long time ago, but you, know, you database professionals, you know, it's um, of course the good use cases. Um, but with many storage engines, it also means that you can maximize the strength of the storage engine and minimize its weakness. So, what is Myrox? Myrox is an engine that uh, Facebook um, made. It's a fork of LevelDB, and uh, it's an interface to RocksDB, and uh, it's 
good for write optimized workloads. Uh, you need to install it in MariaDB. It's not there by default, so you gotta you gotta then load it up. Uh, basically, you install Sony and Pinchay RocksDB. And uh, it turns out that um, Facebook has migrated most of their workloads from MariaDB to MyRox. And they've, they've actually managed to stay um, running uh, with less hardware. So the compression is at least maybe 2x for them. CPU usage hasn't, hasn't increased. And it's based on, a, it's not based on a, B, a balanced B plus tree. It's based on a log structured merge tree. And it's um, good for um, compression workloads. And it seems to be good enough for write optimization. And the other thing that uh, MyRox does is, is apparently also um, has less write amplification, so it's generally uh, quite good in terms of extending the life of your flash. Uh, presumably, most of you are using flash and not um, spinning disk anymore for your databases. I think all your laptops are flash now, too. You probably can't buy spinning disk if you want to. Um, so you can load data really fast. Uh, also, you'll avoid your compaction overheads. And it also has something called read-free replication. Uh, which uh, basically allows you to make sure that you can migrate easily and also give you greater performance. I recommend reading this because there are variances in MyRox implementations. So there are three variants of MyRox implementations. One is the one is from the Facebook MySQL 563, which you should never run because uh, unless you know what you're doing, because you have to compile this yourself and nobody will support you. Then there's a Pagona server. So you've got MyRox with Pagona server, and you've got um, MyRox with MariaDB. Uh, so far, nobody is making just a MyRox with MySQL you know, yet. There is the spider storage engine, uh, which allows you to transparently shard and reshard um, via SQL. So um, spider is, is kind of interesting because um, people like to shard the databases. Um, Sometimes they may want to have to reach out to because you know, we've got one user who's sending too much data. So typically, uh, if you are running a web scale service, you know, this could be one shot, and that could be one shot. But because she loves to upload lots of photos, um, so she, she, she may need to be rebalanced to another shot, possibly. And uh, sharding is, is easy. It's the re-sharding that's hard. And sharding is something that MySQL doesn't seem to really have built in generally speaking, so there are frameworks like Tumblr's Jetpants, um, CNCF's Retest, which powers YouTube. So if you, have, if you ever go to YouTube, you're, you're looking through, you're actually querying MySQL via Retest. And uh, Retest is like fu fully baked with Kubernetes and stuff. But Spider's aim is to ensure that it's fully baked inside the server, and you can write SQL queries to reshard, and you can make shards via SQL. Uh, they've made some some improvements around the partition storage engine as well as the ability to have condition pushed up, which means the conditions get pushed down to the storage engine layer. Uh, and typically, Spider needs to be backed by uh, InnoDB as well. So you can't use all the fancy engines that we talked about earlier, um, but you can use Spider with InnoDB. And MariaDB is likely to push Spider forward because the lead developer of Spider now works for that. And this is an example of of what you do with Spider, right? So you, your application would, would query um, maybe table one, and then it goes looking at a bunch of rows, which are basically Spider partitions at the back of it, and you can query large, large data sets. Now, is Spider proven? There are, there are definitely customers that use Spider out there. I have there. If you go to the MariaDB knowledge base, you will actually see a list of them even. Um, is this uh, you know, going to be more famous? That's hard to say. Should you bet on Vitesse? Um, also hard to say, but it's all open source, so go forth and try. Storage engines are excellent, but um, keep in mind there are always limitations, right? So encryption, for example, does not work with MyRox. Encryption only works with uh, InnoDB and RAF temporary table storage. Galar cluster only works with InnoDB as a backend. Uh, so a lot of things tend to work mostly with just InnoDB first, then maybe eventually become more become expanded to other engines. Uh, then, so there's lots of compression available as well. So you've had initially row compression, then you've got page compression, and now you also have the ability to have column compression. Um, the only supported method for column compression with dictionary support is uh, Zenith in MariaDB. 
Now, this is a feature that also Pocono server has, and uh, there are other compression methods uh, besides Azir. This is an example of, 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 of compression, so you can just do show status like column and it will tell you how many compressed columns there are, in this case one. Um, so dictionary support is something that exists in, in both areas. Invisible columns uh, allow you to basically uh, remove dependencies uh, on applications. So in this case, uh, we've created a table uh, with a secret column and then we inserted some data and then when we do a select from it, we do a, even do a select star, we actually only get the ID and name back and not the invisible default column. And, uh, you, and if you do select ID and name secret, then you actually get it back. And uh, you can actually add columns to the tables without uh, hiding them from an app, uh, which otherwise may fail to run. This, uh, maybe you're changing your, your schema down the line. Uh, you maybe want to just keep historical columns that the new application doesn't have to access anymore. Uh, you can hide system created columns, and, and basically, yeah, a select style will not actually show show it. So this is um, something uh, still unique, I guess, to MariaDB. There is the ability to have instant add column, but this is not as exciting any longer because MySQL has it as well. It came out in a in an eight zero release, was contributed by Tencent. And uh, remember, adding a column typically could uh, be problematic because if you get things like replication lag, and you need to have previously copied the data. Um, but here you go, it's an ad column. Now system version tables, this I think is, uh, still makes Maria uh, kind of unique uh, at the moment. Maybe MySQL 9 will have this too, I don't know. Uh, that's, uh, maybe that's the other thing that's, that's Maria uh, has going for it is that all the plans are on Jira. So MySQL opens up their work logs. Um, when they decide it's time to open them up, Maria has it available on Jira, so if you are judicious and you'd like to go searching for what's coming up in the roadmap of, for the future, you can go check out Jira. Now, system version tables, you, you all can read that. And typically, it can be used for you know, forensic analysis, um, maybe legal requirements, date, data analytics. You can, also, you can also use this for point in time recovery, uh, um, recovering a, ta a table state to a particular state. And you can also make sure that you're also getting timestamp versions of your data so you can track changes inside of the database. Um, Again, this is um, really, really a test to work very well on InnoDB. Try throwing another engine and you may actually start seeing vague problems. And of course, you can also delete history. So here's an example of system version tables. I apologize it's kind of small. But in this case, I've created a table called employees. And I've inserted in employees that Colin, which me, is going to earn $1,000 as a marketer a month. Then, um, you know, thousand dollars living in Singapore is pretty uh, expensive. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's too cheap, right? I mean, uh, what, what would I do? I'd have to live on the street, probably. Um, so I decided, so I decided to tell the company now I need to earn ten thousand dollars. Now, ten thousand dollars is about the average Singaporean earns, right? Yeah. Okay. But of course, they're like, we can't pay a market at ten thousand dollars. It's freaking insane. Okay, you gotta move to engineering now, right? So that's actually what happens in this particular example. So then you can again go back in time. So now, now, now I'm in engineering, I'm earning ten thousand dollars, and I can actually live in Singapore and come to Malaysia. Asia. But uh, if you want, if you want to look at history, uh, we can go back and see that uh, when I was in marketing, they, they made a mistake and jacked my salary up to ten thousand, and actually initially I was, I was only earning a, a, a thousand. And then you can also do things like select staff from employees. Um, you know, from system time now minus say an interval of I'll say a year, and you can get different different stats back. So you can go back in time for your database. It's it's kind of nice, and it leads on to, to uh, this thing called ad hoc. So you can say uh, you know select from employees to the system time with a random time stamp. What was I at that point in time? And at that point in time, I was I was in marketing, earning a thousand dollars and trying to eat free. In addition. Uh, MySQL has always had auto increment, but in Oracle they have this thing called sequences, uh, which allows you to have auto number fields uh, for sequences. It's not meant to replace um, auto increment in, in, in MariaDB, uh, but uh, it does exist. This is more for Oracle compatibility for when you want to migrate from, from Oracle. Um, now, sequences do show up when you do show tables. Uh, so the way it's implemented is it's like a table. So it turns out that if you do lock table, it will actually lock your sequence, your sequence generation. So this is unlike other databases, so not quite 
like, like Oracle, but uh, also available for you to use. Here's an example uh, of, of sequences where you can use things like select next del sequence, select last del sequence, as opposed to actually getting the auto increment. And uh, if you turn on SQL mode equals to Oracle, you actually can uh, use Oracle like syntax, just like sequence underscore name next del. So, so only only one person said they write PLSQL here, but if you happen to, to write PLSQL, you'll note that you can, you know, sequences of Oracle, Maxwell, obviously, or packages exist. Um, there is um, kind of a compatibility like uh, documentation here. I, I highly recommend you to read it. So I'm going to guess that most people don't use Oracle's database as much as in, in the FOSS environment. Lots of people use Oracle's database, and FOSS AHI is expected to use open source database. Proxy support. Um, so, if you use HAProxy uh, sitting in front of your uh, between your application and your database, typically you need a proxy protocol support. Um, this it starts up as a, a HAProxy spec, uh, basically client connects to RedDB, and then it actually has uh, the ability to note what the uh, client IP is as opposed to the proxy IP, and this is good for various things, including when you're setting up for like payloads. There's also some other good stuff RedDB has uh, in previous releases. I'm just highlighting some of them. Uh, you know, things like restricting the speed of reading the binary log from the master, um, decimals uh, being larger, activity immediately. The AWS key management plugin, to be fair, there is also one for MySQL. They're both different implementations. Um, the MySQL one might only be the enterprise release, not the open source area. Uh, table elimination, if you do anchor modeling, uh, SQL 2008 uh, standard, that's something that's still available. Use statistics if you don't want to use performance schema, and so forth. There are a few other bits, slides will be available online, don't worry. Like, they come from MySQL 8, they say, hey, I want to check out this MariaDB 10.3 thing. You couldn't realize that there's a whole bunch of nice stuff that MySQL 8 has, really does not have, and may, and may never have. For example, uh, based on functionality, while it's there, um, the operators are different. So MySQL has like 26 operators, maybe for really it's like 20, they're not the same. Um, ETIPs, as I mentioned, the local production IPs are different. I personally love this thing called the X protocol and MySQL SH because you can, if some people don't like the query with SQL, they like the query with, say, JavaScript. I don't know if anyone uses a Python interface, but does exist. This doesn't exist in you know, RedDB. You can't use the application. Performance schema is extremely old, it's from 5.6, it's using up 5.7, 8.0 and stuff. So, migrations, password migrations. So, if you have users who are, who are using the caching SHA-256 password in MySQL 8 and you decide to migrate to RedDB, it won't work because RedDB only has 10 So, all users are going to have to regenerate passwords. Now, you create users with 10 in RedDB and you migrate to MySQL, you're going to have to do the same thing to your users, you're going to have to regenerate passwords. Because they're both different, Shop and Physics and Online. Uh, why don't you stop around passwords, users? It's more compatible with old MySQL as opposed to anything else. If you like optimizer hints, it's not there. The optimizer tracer is also not there. I, I love this. This is, this is the amazing feature that I love, set assist. Because if you say I want to set the buff full size to something larger while I'm running, I can say I, I want to set the persistence of it so that one restart, it, it, it takes that. This is something you don't get in uh, MariaDB. So, um, I will be around here. So, if you have questions about MariaDB and its differences, uh, feel free to uh, say hello, um, or you can uh, tweet or write me an email. Um, any questions? Like, we'll take one question if you have one. Anybody? <laughs> From where can you get the presentation? From wherever you get the presentation. FOSSASIA.org. <laughs> and, and slide share. Yeah. Oh yeah, I should have put that there. Slide share on that slash pipeline. Okay. Thank you.